Hello, everyone. I'm Tiffany Farrell, President of Southern Maryland Audubon Society. Thank you for joining our Audubon chapter for the monthly program, Local Wildlife River Otters. Our presenter tonight is Karen McDonald. Over the past 16 years, Karen has been the Educational Outreach Coordinator for the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, though she has more than 23 years as an informal educator. She works with scientists and researchers to translate Smithsonian science into hands-on learning opportunities for K-12 students, as well as creating teacher professional development workshops and mentoring interns to become the next generation of informal educators. Previously, she worked for the Delaware State Park System as a nature center manager and park naturalist. She has an MS in biology from the University of Central Arkansas and a BS in environmental science and philosophy from Ferrum College, Virginia. Our program here focuses on the river otter. Although it's native to the Chesapeake Bay, not much research has been done on its populations, habits, and role in the bay's food webs. Karen will introduce us to basic river otter biology and otter research taking place at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. Welcome, Karen. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming tonight, and I appreciate you taking your evening to join us. And some of you might have seen previous talks with river otters. If you have, thanks for coming. I did include some new videos, so hopefully you get to see some new material today. So I'm excited to share with you our research and what we do. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get us going. Um, can you see my screen OK? Good. Yep, yep, I got it. Just making sure. So I call this things you ought to know about river otters. Now, as a naturalist, I started out actually in bird research and bats. And so I did some echolocation work. And then I worked with um, warblers and Kentucky warblers and painted buntings and a variety of things. And then eventually I moved to working with Hawkwatch International. Um, and now I work with my wife and I help her and assist her rescuing birds of prey and raptors, but I've been a lifelong birder and naturalist. And so otters is just kind of a natural uh, transition. It's also a really great charismatic organism that I can use for teaching um, that also correlates really nicely with our research. So with that said, things you otter know about otters. Now, most of the time when people think about Smithsonian, you know, I, I hear things like the castle, the elephant, the tundra, you know, air and space, giant pandas, magazines, things like that. But what most people don't think of when they see Smithsonian is things like our research centers. And we have a whole spectrum of those, everything from the Smithsonian Astrophysics Observatory, which is up in Havid Yad. Um, and they have their own space telescope, which is looking at x-rays in space and exoplanets, the Arctic Studies Institute, um, the Institution Archives, the Tropical Research Institute in Panama, Forest Geo, Marine Geo, Conservation Biology Institute. So the Smithsonian is a lot more than just a repository of items and artifacts and things like that. We actually have active scientists in North America, but also all over the world. And that's part of what we do at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, or CERC. Um, so we're located on the Road River, and normally I would be here where the little X is, and we sit on about 2,300 acres of land and on a brackish water, um, body of water, the Road River, and that's been where we've been doing the majority of our studies with river otters, including the South River and a few other locations where people have posted sightings for us. And like I said, we have a, a big campus and we consider it a natural laboratory. It's a long term conservation site, but it's also where our scientists do research in the forests and on the land, but also in the water. And there's about 15 miles of protected shoreline, which is a great place for us to do some of our research with river otters. And of course, we've got forests and wetlands and marshes. Now, I'm not going to go through all of our research labs. We've got about 21 of them, um, but just some examples of those are things like our fish conservation lab that works with sharks and cow nose rays, um, biogeochemistry lab looking at climate change and how it affects marshes, 
um, marine and estuarine ecology, microbial ecology, spot the birder in that picture, um, and then a whole bunch of different things like marine biodiversity, ocean acidification, terrestrial ecology. All of these different laboratories are based out of CERC, they work at CERC, or they may travel around the world using CERC as a hub and a place to come back to. Now, I am the education director and coordinator, and so I work with translating those really complex science concepts into understandable things that make science and nature meaningful for our visitors, for students who may ne have never encountered science and nature before in the wild. So that's my job is I take that science and I try to make sense of it and to allow students to engage outside, hands on in the water, in the forest with that scientist and do things like our scientists do. And that includes teaching teachers how to take those practices of science and translate them. And so for the purposes of this talk, um, I am actually a member of what's called the IUCN Otter Specialist Group. For almost every animal you can think of, there is a specialist group with the IUCN, and these are the folks that do the classification of, um, of organisms as vulnerable, threatened, and endangered. And the Otter Specialist Group, of course, focuses on otters, and that's around the world, but that also includes here in North America. And so one of the things that I like to ask is, have you ever seen a river otter? Now, some of you in the chat said you had, and that's great. In fact, river otters are more common than you might think. And the reason people don't see them all the time is in part because they're mostly nocturnal. Now, those patterns I've seen change, especially the ones that are um, with us at Cirque in the wintertime when there aren't a lot of people around. I see them scamper across the ice on the river. Um, so it really just depends, but primarily they are nocturnal. So people don't see them all the time and they're pretty shy. Um, they tend to stay away from people, but they are curious, which is sometimes why people encounter them in the wild. And so some of these pictures are actually coming from a friend of mine that took them from um, some river otters in Kentucky, believe it or not. But here in the Chesapeake Bay, river otters aren't well understood. They haven't been studied a lot. Um, there are some people who have done some studies that haven't been published and some folks who have done some informal studies, but there hasn't been anything official. Now, we have started to do that type of research, but I wanted to kind of back up and talk about how we got there because the origin story of this has been kind of fun is essentially we have teaching docs at CERC where I teach off of. You can see some of our classes there. And I started noticing scat on our docks and I was like, okay, this isn't raccoon scat, it's not fox scat, what is this stuff? Because it was filled with, you know, fish scales and crab pieces. So I was thinking, okay, maybe this is otters. So we ended up putting out trail cameras and starting to try to see if we could actually capture these creatures and confirm that it was otters. And so the trail cameras began to give us some insight as to what we had out there. So I wanted to share with you one of the videos where it was an up close um, of some of our otters that we've been seeing on our docks. Now, this one's kind of fun because this notice that we can actually identify some individuals. If you watch at the very end, one of these otters is the one I call Crooktail, and he has a little broken tail. These are two males, they're playing, they're wrestling, they're, they're not fighting, they're just having a good time. And they just make me happy. There's the crook tail in the, the back there. If you see that broken tail, it's kind of hard to tell them apart, but that actually let us know um, who, who that otter was, which is kind of unique. We don't always get that, that glimpse into individuals. So. And we also discovered with these trail cameras some very funny things. Um, if you can turn your sound up, you might hear something that's pretty funny. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and play. Now listen carefully, you'll hear a little wind, um, but you'll hear something pretty funny. This is our otter leaving us some presents. And 
And for those of you that couldn't hear, that is my first recording ever of a very gassy otter, which we had no idea. Um, but this scat is telling us that the otters are there and they've been using our docks as a latrine for about four years now that we've been recording. Um, so by using these trail cameras, we started to get an idea of how many otters we had, you know, what they were doing on our docks and, you know, seeing you know, what individuals there were. But that all gave me a lot of fodder in my head. And as a naturalist, I wanted to know more, right? I wanted to know what are they eating? How many are there in the Chesapeake Bay? Why are they here? What are they looking for? Are they okay with humans? Why are they coming up on my dock? And uh, I even had somebody reach out to me and go, why are they pooping on my dock? And can I get them to stop? Um, but I had a lot more questions than answers. So I started doing a little bit of research um, about river otters in general, and then trying to find out more specifically about our bay otters. Now, somebody asked about, you know, the species that are in North America. Now, the ones that we have are the North American river otter, oftentimes, excuse me, you'll see them referred to as ROs or river otters. And then we have sea otters. Now, the ones that are here in the Chesapeake Bay, we only have river otters. The sea otters are confined only to the Pacific areas. Um, so river otters are inland and they're coastal and they're estuarine. They're across the US, but the sea otters are not. And if you look at these two, they're very, very different. We're gonna compare those in just a minute. Um, but the only ones we have are the North American river otters. And so, what I do want to show you is of the 13 species around the world, there's only one that's of least concern, and that's the river otters that are here in North America. But look at this list of otters around the world. They're either vulnerable, near threatened, or in the case of our sea otter, endangered. Um, and that's because of pressures due to human development, um, water quality issues. In the case of things like the Asian small clawed otters, people take them as pets. They really should not be pets. Um, but because they're small and they're cute, they are used in the pet trade, which has been made illegal now, and, and which is great. But unfortunately, it's still happening. And so most people don't realize that this is happening to our otters around the world. And as an apex predator, that's a big red flag for the health of our ecosystems. And even though river otters themselves aren't endangered, they're still a really good indicator of the health of the system. And we'll kind of get back to that. Um, but I wanted to talk about the differences in river otters and sea otters, just to kind of give you that visual about, you know, what makes our river otters special. And of course, we talked about least concern versus endangered, right? Now, the North American river otters, they can be on land and water. And in fact, they can den up on land. They can run and scamper across land. They're very comfortable in both mediums, which is also why they're really good indicators of health of ecosystems, because they're using land and water in that transition zone. Whereas your sea otters are just that. They like to be in the water. They don't like to come on land very often. Um, and they are primarily aquatic. Now, their ranges do overlap. In fact, river otters and sea otters have been seen in the same areas. They don't fight. There's no territoriality. Usually they just go, ah, and they go on their merry way. Um, but they primarily stick to their own zones, right? Now, the other big thing is sea otters are huge. They can be 60 to 90 pounds, all right? Our river otters, 10 to 33 pounds. So they're not nearly as big. And then if you look at sea otters, they have more flipper-like feet, web feet. And the interesting thing is they're one of the few creatures like cats that has retractable claws. Um, so that they can hold on to sea urchins and to their food, whereas ours don't. In fact, ours just have the webbed feet. And something really important about our otters, which is what we were finding, is that they poo on land and they leave latrines and diet evidence for us, whereas with sea otters, it's a lot harder. We have to observe them in the wild to see what they're eating because they don't leave latrines, they poo in the water. And People ask me, do they have predators? Do these, these creatures have predators? And the pup phase is the most vulnerable when they're babies, but you know, river otters can be taken by eagles, alligators, and crocodiles in the ecosystems where they are. 
coyotes will take them, bobcats, humans will take them for hunting because there is a fur bearing season. Um, and then we also have the sea otters. They are not hunted, but they can be eaten by things like killer whales and sea lions and eagles. So they do have predators. It's not that common. And like I said, they're mostly vulnerable when they're pups, when they're little. And just to kind of give you an idea of where river otters have lived historically and where they now live. You can see the map here. In brown is the um, present day range and then the historic range is um, in the lighter color. And so uh, there have been some efforts for reintroducing them, especially in Pennsylvania. I work with a scientist who's been doing that. Now they can live in a variety of habitats. They can be brackish water, fresh water. Um, they don't love salt water. They can be in marine habitats habitats, but they tend to like the more fresh end of the spectrum. But the really important thing is they don't like polluted waters. And so if you see river otters, typically it's in environments that are clean or they're transitioning from zone to zone. But they really don't like to be in dirty polluted waters because that means their food's not healthy and they're not healthy, right? And they can migrate. In fact, I have one that's um, that was donated to us to be stuffed and mounted that was hit by a car. Um, so they can migrate over land, which can be a problem with cars and interstates. But this is the thing, uh, this number, I've seen this thing, it says home ranges of three to 15 square miles. Now with otters in the Chesapeake Bay, that's not established. We don't have a lot of good information about what the actual home range is of bay otters. Um, we're still trying to establish that. And in fact, that's gonna be part of what our diet study is going to be with some of our urban waterway projects um, and collecting scat from these species. So that's not fully established for us yet. And just to give you an idea, the map with the blue on the, the end there, that's exactly the range along the coastal zone um, where our uh, sea otters live. So a few fast facts about river otters, which I love. They are in the weasel family, and I love to call them stinky weasels because they do have stink glands. Now, they don't spray like skunks, right? So they're not, you know, leaving ooze and smell and gunk, um, but they do have a gland and they do um, secrete a type of jelly or mucus that they use for marking and for scent, um, but they are in that mustelid in that weasel family. And then like I said, 10 to 33 pounds. Now I've seen statistics about females being about a third of the size of males. And I question this, and this is for the otters that I've seen so far. And of course I need a much bigger sample size, but the females that I've seen so far have been pretty big and they've looked about the size of the males. I need to do more studies on this, but so far what I've seen is they're bigger than I thought they would be. Um, and then you know, eight to nine years in the wild is average, and then 16 in captivity is the longest, and then mostly nocturnal. I also like to say crepuscular, dawn and dusk, because that tends to be the times that I'll actually physically see them around our dock areas. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about their adaptations, and these are some of the things that, that I was learning about doing the research, um, but that also give me some insight into the otters. So they have a long muscular tail, it acts like a rudder, it helps them swim. They have strong hind legs with webbed feet for swimming. They have really dense thick fur with oil glands that help keep them waterproof. They have little wee ears on the top of their heads that are close to the heads that keep them water dynamic. And they can close them off when they dive, which is kind of a neat adaptation. And they can also close their nose off when they dive and go underwater. And it's estimated the longest that it's been seen, they've been underwater is about four minutes, which is pretty impressive. Um, their necks are about the same size as their heads. So again, it keeps them hydrodynamic. They have front feet with really tactile hands and claws that they can use for holding and gripping, and they're very sensitive. And then they also have whiskers, which is, um, are also called vibrissae, and especially in the bay where the water's pretty dark um, or hard to see through in a lot of sediment, those whiskers and those hands that are able to feel things, they are able to sense and to move around in that turbid water pretty well because they've got that. And of course, they've got this little membrane that goes over their little eyeballs that helps them um, move around too. And so that's that eyelid-like goggles. 
And then they have really sharp teeth. And for those of you that are skull aficionados, they have all carnassial teeth. So all of their teeth are sharp for ripping and tearing and eating um, meat, essentially. You know, and that diet is varied. We're gonna talk about some of the things we found, um, but primarily fish is the biggest component, but they'll eat a whole bunch of other things too. And the really neat thing is otters have the thickest fur of any mammal and especially your sea otters they have super super thick dense fur and our river otters are just the same a million hairs per square inch and one of the things that's really cute if you ever watch the um the sea otters floating on their backs with the babies look carefully and you'll see that the mom will actually blow air into the baby's fur and the river otters do this to themselves when they're grooming and blowing that air into the fur dries it out but also helps keep them buoyant helps keep them floaty um, so that's one way that mom helps keep those babies afloat because they can't swim very well yet so this is the thing we're, we're doing this research i was doing this research on otters right and using these trail cameras, we were starting to learn some new things. Now, I, I, re I reached out to one of our collaborators, Tom Surpass, and he works with Frostburg um, State University, and he is Dr. Otter. He's done otter introductions. He works with otters in Africa and all over the world. Um, but he was curious about bay otters because they not a ton is known, and he himself was curious about the populations, which is what sparked the research that we've been doing at CERC too, along with these videos and things that we were finding. So I wanted to share with you some of the things we were learning um, from these trail cameras, the footage. One of the very first things I learned is you got to tie down your equipment, and this is why. Now, he never actually successfully pulled it down, but he tried really hard. And then his buddy tried really hard. And I just thought it was the funnest thing in the belly of an otter. See the one in the background is actually gonna do a little scat donation for us. While well, this friend keeps trying to take my camera down. Um, so that was a group of males. Talk about that. Typically the males travel together in these groups. Um, they're called rocks. Now it's been estimated, I've seen reading that they can travel in groups of up to 10. I've never seen that in the videos. I've always seen no more than four, but that doesn't mean that there aren't bigger groups out there. I'm just wondering if that's the carrying capacity for a group with the fish that are available um, in the, the near shore areas where they're hunting. And you see they're perfectly comfortable. Um, on the docks, they're rubbing and sliding, they're drying their fur off and getting a little bit more floofed out and waterproofed, um, spreading that oil around on their fur too. And they're just hanging out in the back there. And some of the other things we started seeing were some neat social behaviors with marking and grooming and how they interacted. And so this is just a video showing some of those interactions. And you might even be able to hear it a little bit. Mostly they're just run, rubbing around. But these are distinct populations. These are not the same four otters that we saw in another video. And that's their little poo dance. They dance their little feet back and forth. And, uh, you know, I think it's funny, but it also may be in part to um, secrete uh, not only poo, but also some of the um, anal gland stuff that comes out um, with their scent. And so that that little funny dance may actually have more to do uh, than just dancing. And then for this one, if you've got sound, you might want to turn it up, but we started hearing vocalizations that we had never heard before. And in particular, this is the first time I had actually heard mating vocalization, um, which is a really interesting chittering sound.
And that was the first time I had heard that. And then since then, we have gotten more of those instances of the mating behavior and that calling. And even off camera, I've heard it when they've been in the water. Um, but the interesting thing is, this was in March, which is about the time that um, river otters are known to be mating. Um, in fact, they've known to breed December to April. Um, but what's interesting is that was kind of late. And some of the videos that we've been seeing has been February to March. Um, so I think bay otters may have a little different time period. I don't know yet. Again, this is going to require some more study to see. That was really weird. Um, but, you know, it's estimated the pups are born February to April. I will say, I literally just checked trail camera game, uh, the cards uh, a couple of days ago, and I'm seeing a female. I swear she's a female. She's fat. She's preggers. She's got to have a couple of pups in there. Um, she's about to pop. And so if this is true, that's about on target for when she should be having those pups. Now, the females can actually delay their implantation. They can choose when to impregnate themselves. One to five pups, it depends on the female. Um, and this is that vulnerable time. Now, if you do want to see otters, we do have them at the National Zoo. Um, we had the first, uh, I guess, birthing in 2019 of otter pups in 130 years, which I thought was kind of fun, right? Um, and then Laura asked, could they be another species that mates for fun or bonding? You know, I haven't seen that. Typically, the reason I say I, I haven't seen it or I don't think so is because usually the males travel in their romps separately from the females and they don't interact at all unless it's for breeding season. Now, they'll leave each other messages, but they don't like to be around each other. And that's especially because you have like um, the moms with the pups and they're pretty solitary. Now, gestation, I'm going to have to check. Honestly, I don't remember um, if anyone remembers gestation length. I think it's three months, something like that. It may be a little longer, um, but I would have to Google that one. So I wanted to show you a few more things that we did learn um, about otter behavior. Now, one of the questions was, you know, inland, when they're living in the woods, they're living in creeks and ponds, that's great, but they're living now in, you know, urban environments, they're living on docks, they're living along shorelines, and we didn't know, hey, can they pull up on a dock? Do they have upper body strength to do that? Or are they leaping entirely? How are they getting up onto these docks to leave these latrines? So this is one of the things we actually gathered some evidence for. Uh, and this is one of the videos. Of course, this is also why you need to tie things down again. <clears throat> this is actually along one of our trails. I think this might be a little female because um, I'm not seeing little tail lights and she is solitary. She does tend to come around. It could also be the pup of the year too. And Curtis, yes, they do share habitat with beavers. Absolutely. And how do they know there's a camera? I believe they can see the infrared lights that are on. It doesn't seem to bother them. They're more curious about it, but really the ones that are on my docks now just ignore it entirely. It doesn't seem to bother them at all. And um, person that says you're talking about mink, I will actually show you some pictures of some other species that are living around them. So hang on to that question. That's a good question. So she's just sniffing around and hanging out. But the main thing is I want to show you the upper body strength on this one and how she's able to pull up. And slinky weasel right there. And she's able to just pull up onto that. So that answered some questions for us about how they're pulling up onto those dock environments and um, getting up on things, right? And so the other thing that we were finding out is they don't mind floating docks either. They will use those um, indiscriminately. They'll use hard docks for leaving markings as well as floating docks. Um, this was at a marina uh, where they contacted me about a lot of scat being on their docks. But I just wanted to show you that they don't have a fear of that movement at all or that habitat where people are. They're a little shy, but they're still there and they're still leaving those markings. And this guy's just curious. I think he just sees the light, but it's like, oh, I just want to know about that. 
Um, and then the other one that I wanted to kind of show you were some other vocalizations. Now, this isn't the, the best video. Um, oh, yeah, and they might be smelling the, the cameras, too. I think that's a great, great point. Um, but these vocalizations are really interesting. So if you've got your sound, you may want to turn it up a little bit. You can hear some chirps and some chitters um, that I hadn't heard before that I thought were just great. So this is definitely a group of males. What's interesting is they are communally feeding. They're sharing food. Um, so they are sharing. And then I was hearing some squeaks and some e -e 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 -e, and different vocalizations, which are very social. Um, typically, I hear them when they're together. Now, I have heard another one, which is a snort, um, which is usually like a warning thing. Um, but I didn't realize they made so many squeaks, chirps, sounds, and chitters that, that we were actually hearing. So this kind of gets us to the really meat and potatoes of the studies that we've been doing and I've been doing with schools is the poop, right? It's not easy to capture otters or to try to look at them in the wild other than on trail cameras. And so they do leave us a lot of clues and that includes their poop. So one otter poop is called a sprain, like a sprained ankle. And then two or more um, poops there is a latrine. And then they leave behind this kind of yellowish looking marking mucus, um, which is gross and disgusting. But this is the interesting thing. This um, scat that they're leaving behind it's hard to get DNA out of it to figure out what otter is which or what food they're eating because a lot of times they're eating crayfish or they're eating blue crabs, um, which has a chitinase in it, has a lot of chitin, which breaks down and degrades DNA. But what we're finding is in the mucus, in the goo, it actually has a nice sloughing of DNA from the intestinal lining so we can use that. And so this is something that we're going to start looking at. And so I started talking um, with Tom, with Tom uh, from Frostburg State, and then Katrina Lohan, who's one of our scientists at CERT, and she studies marine diseases and parasites. And I know this sounds scary, but it's not. It's a really important part of our food web um, because she's interested in what we call multi-host systems. So food webs where parasites and other things in some cases like plastics can be passed from organism to organism as they're eaten. And then what are the roles of those parasites? And you know, how are things like oysters and the health of oysters affecting um, disease rates in other organisms as well? And so she's innately interested in parasites. And so that was kind of a natural tie-in because when I was looking at otter scat, I started seeing some worms. And we know that, um, the sea otters are actually endangered in part because of toxoplasmosis from cat poo that's washing off the land and affecting them and causing brain issues in them, which may also be affecting our river otters. There have been some studies, but um, I haven't read a ton on those yet, but I think it's something interesting to keep an eye on. So she's part of what's called the Smithsonian Interconnected Health Initiative. This is huge. It's 140 countries, international, and it's scientists that work with wildlife, and they're looking at the interactions of humans and wildlife and trying to figure out the interconnections and taking this multidisciplinary approach um, to science, to people's cultures, and to educating people about human impact on the environment. And so she's been doing scavenger hunts. I just love that. I thought that was great. Um, with the scat, trying to figure out what's in that scat, what are they eating, and what are these parasites that are moving from the fish into the otters? Because some of those same fish that the otters are eating are the types that we eat, like your striped bass and your white perch. And so this may be a way of looking at parasite loads in ecosystems. Right. And the other thing, and this is me, like 
I just think that otters, and based on other studies that people have done, they are wonderful flagship species, right? For research and for education, they're charismatic. Um, they're really good symbols and rallying points for students. And as you can tell from the number of people here, it's, you know, people love them. They're really fun. And so I've started using the otters as a gateway into the science because it's a really good hook to get people interested in science. And so what we have started doing, and this is not big yet, it's really a pilot study. We've started doing something called um, the Chesapeake Bay Otter Alliance, which is um, stakeholders in the Road and West River, some community members, river keepers, groups around CERC, um, but also uh, we're starting up a, an otter spotting uh, website where you can put in your sightings of otters or your videos and you can post where you've seen them and we're starting to track those and we're just now starting to get more funding for that because we haven't even had staff that have been able to do a lot with that yet but we're hoping to expand that project um, to reach more and more people and in fact Katrina just got a grant for something called Urban Waterways Project which will be looking at otters in urban environments like DC where they saw uh, a river otter not far from the tidal basin which was kind of neat um, but this is just new it's piloting and we're just getting it off the ground now, I like to call the uh, the folks who are helping me study scat, scat scouts, and of course, I love the logo that one of our scientists helped us draw, but I'm using the otter scat also as a gateway to teach people about food webs and students about food webs in the bay, because we can take that scat and clean it, and we can look at what's in that diet, right? So talking about this gateway. Now, this is a thing, if you look at textbooks, and I'd love to correct this, if you look at textbooks of otters in food webs, you're always going to see sea otters and whales and sea urchins, and that's a great, that's an epic story, but it's never, otters are never put into the food webs of the Chesapeake Bay, and I'd like to fix that, because they are an apex predator, um, they are an important part of this ecosystem, and I do think they're a good gateway for learning about these multi-host systems of parasites and also things like microplastics and chemicals because the grass shrimp that's eaten by the minnow that's eaten by the bigger fish that's eaten by the river otter definitely you know we can track the progress of those hosts and track the health of that ecosystem right so i think it's pretty cool so I wanted to show you what I've been doing, which is gross, but really fun. We actually have our own individual poop spatula. And I tell my staff person, this is Ann Otter Duties um, on her contract. But uh, what we do is we go out and we collect the scat from the latrine so they don't seem to care. Um, but we'll collect the scat, we'll wash it with soap, believe it or not, and um, we'll shake it up, clean it, um, run it through sieves several times. And then we otter clave, actually autoclave it or bake it so that it's sterile. And then we can send those scales to citizen scientists to help us sort through those scales, right? And I've been doing this as a pilot with students. Um, I've gotten some pretty good results of them taking photos of fish scales and bones with their cameras um, on phones and with microscopes and clip-on lenses. Uh, but this is sort of a thing that I'm testing to see, can we do citizen science in mass using otters? And that's because, you know, squamatology is the study of fish scales. And it's well known that individual fish species, their scales are unique, right? So the family of sunfish have a certain shape and family of striped bass have a certain shape. And it's, it's not like I can go see Bob or Jeannie or, you know, Cliff and know exactly which otter that is. But I can know the, or I'm sorry, which fish it is, but I can know the species. I can get it at least to that. And so what I've done is I had my um, interns and some of our volunteers go out and collect some known species of fish um, to take some samples. There are some other um, examples from different studies in the region. And then I took those scales and these are actually some that I took photos of under microscopes and using the USB microscope. Uh, and then what we can do is we can pair these unknown samples with the known samples, right? And so we've learned a lot. And then I see someone said at, at Jug Bay, it looks like a lot of crayfish in the summer and fish in the winter. And we're seeing that. And in fact, I'm gonna show you a couple of things that we had, I had never seen before. Um, but this video was in August, it looks like. 
but check this out. This is one thing that we had never gotten on camera before, but this is our otters. Well, and again, why you tie down your cameras. Um, but take a look in the background once this guy gets done playing with my camera. Look carefully, you see the two bringing up a blue crab? And that blue crab just about made it out. <laughs> this otter just really loves my camera. So hang on just a second and you'll see where they came up just a moment ago. They're gonna come back up there. Um, they've been subduing this blue crab because he's given them a good fight. But what I do find interesting is they're hunting together, which is interesting. And you don't always see that in uh, weasel species. And in some cases they are sharing that food, which is again, not always seen in species where they're hunting. Um, so this guy's coming up with a whole bunch of grass and the poor, poor crab. Now there is some dominance here though. Like you can see this otter is dominant even though the other one brought it up and the other guy in the back gets the leg. Like, no, no, this is mine. Mm -hmm. And we've seen a variety of foods. Now this is interesting is for the first time I saw in an otter latrine, and this is one of our state parks, I actually saw the head of a snakehead fish. And it was right smack dab in an otter latrine next to a pile of scat. And so, that's pretty good evidence. I didn't get that on film because it was before I had put a camera out, but I do believe they're eating invasive snakeheads, which I would love to get more evidence on. Um, but I think that's pretty interesting. Now, this video um, shows one eating an eel. And if you look closely on the right, um, that one is actually eating a duck. Look for the, um, the fin or the, sorry, the foot. I know it's a duck because I went out and gathered the guts later to try and figure out what duck it was. It's a little duck. And I know you just see their backs here. They'll turn in just a moment. See that little foot? And then you can see kind of that long eel-like thing in the back here. They do just seem to enjoy their food. I'm not going to lie. Now, this video, if animals killing other animals bothers you, I will say turn away for about two minutes or a minute, um, because this is the first time I had ever actually gotten an otter with a duck, bringing it alive up onto the dock, which is interesting because I had only ever seen them bring up prey um, that was dead or dispatched. But in this case, it brought up a live flappy flappy duck. And you can probably tell what it is if you look carefully. This is, of course, is in winter. In fact, it was not that long or about this time of year. It was interesting that they're using a man-made structure to bring their food up out of the water and to dispatch it as opposed to drowning it or pulling it underwater or, you know, doing something with it. Uh, other than bringing it up just to eat. And so eventually he eats the whole thing. Um, but what is interesting is they sometimes leave fish heads and other bits around and they're always scavenged by other things, raccoons. And um, we have herons that will eat the bits and crows and things like that. So they are part of that food web, which I find interesting. And so this is one of my favorite videos of all time. Um, talking about these food webs, I had no idea this happened, but this is a term, kleptoparasitism, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It is klepto, stealing, and parasitizing, like not benefiting the host. So watch carefully, and you can even hear the vocalization. This was really neat. Guy in the back, he's so not helpful. He 
sí, súper. Just looks around like what just happened? Where'd it go? Where's my fish? Dude, why didn't you warn me? <laughs> All right, so I, I am gonna rewind that just because it's worth watching. Now I have several of these videos of raccoons stealing fish and the otter never fights. There's always this like chittering and he just gives it up. And I don't know if it's just doesn't want to fight. If you watch carefully in the back, you can actually see the raccoon crawl down the dock. He's actually crawling down. Um, his little eye shine will show. And this one clearly sees it, but he also clearly does not warn the other one, which I think is interesting. It's whole self-preservation. And I did ask members of the IUCM group, this the otter specialist group, about kleptoparasitism in otters um, and if other people had seen other species doing this. Um, and some of the folks from around the world had told me they had seen eagles doing it and they had seen coyotes um, taking prey food from the otters and they didn't end up fighting it. They just lost their food and their fish essentially and this is one of the things i've started doing with students is analyzing trail camera images because there's a really clear pattern of when otters show up raccoons patrol the dock shortly after and sometimes before so the raccoons know the otters are there and there's some there's some good statistics to be found in the videos that we've been doing so you know, just kind of bringing this all back. It's really an experiment. A lot of this has just been me having fun putting trail cameras out, grabbing the scientists saying, hey, look at this cool stuff. Let's start trying to explore it more and get some grants and try to get people interested. And I'm still learning how to use these trail cameras. I've lost them to floods and high tides. There is some technique to using trail cameras in the coastal zone um, because of plants, because of storms, because of the otters themselves pulling the cameras down cold changes battery life and all sorts of things so it's really been you know a process but i am starting to offer um, trail camera workshops so if this is something you're interested in definitely um, reach out to me and kind of the last thing that i wanted to share with you too was somebody had asked about the species that are found around otters you know i know we have other species in the area but what's interesting is I started seeing a real correlation of those raccoons and otters, right? Um, but also foxes and other creatures, right? And so what I started getting recordings of were foxes actually doing this. So watch this little foxy here. This little red fox. So this is a lat latrine where the otters have been. You've seen them in the other videos, right? Foxes are very curious. But watch what she does. So she overmarks right on the latrine, right? And I've got a lot of videos of this and it's not just a one-time occurrence. In fact, the foxes will go out of their way to lift a leg on the latrine. Now I asked Tom Surfast, our otter guy about this and he studies um, uh, otters in Yellowstone National Park. And he shared with me that they've done some research and they have shown that this is not unusual. In Yellowstone, they have shown that apex predators like wolves and bears and big cats will actually overmark otter latrines. They're not eating the scat. They're not, you know, doing anything other than just marking on it, which may be a really interesting tool in the long run for looking at species that are in an area apex predators and doing population counts, which I think is just, wow, okay, that's neat. And then somebody asked me, okay, wait, what's, what's up with this wolf, right? And I think that is either a deer or an elk head that it has in its mouth, I'm not 100% sure, but that's so cool. <laughs> but these were all taken at an otter latrine. Um, so just really neat, neat concept that we can track apex predators 
with otters too. And then I started seeing some other species I had no idea we had in the area, including this little guy, which is a mink. So look carefully, you're gonna see his little white chin and um, tail, and this is that same overlook where the otters are. And we'd never seen these guys before. They're really elusive, but they're in that same weasel family. So it makes sense that they would be in the same area and overmarking where the otters are, right? And then that also got us to this guy, which I apologize is kind of grainy, but this is a short-tailed weasel. And we had a big long debate about this guy, but this, I think we landed on the fact this is a short-tailed weasel. Um, it's not a mink, it doesn't have a white tail. It's got a different physiology to it. And that was all we got, but that was the first time we had ever seen this short-tailed weasel. He's got little black feet. He's got a white undercarriage all the way down. Yeah, so kind of neat, right? Um, so these trail cameras have been so fun and you know, you can get them for 40 bucks. Now on Amazon, um, they're cheap enough that you can put them out without worrying about them too much, um, but it's worth just exploring and seeing fun behavior from animals. Like I had no idea raccoons, raccoons swam, um, but they do it pretty regularly. Like if you check these guys out, they're wet and they're going back for a little dip and swimming from location to location, right? And they're pretty good swimmers. But this is the same place where otters are coming up on the dock too. Um, but I had never seen that before. So it's been really a neat tool for natural history, for exploring um, our habitats and ecosystems, right? And so this is the thing, I'm not an expert in otters. I'm learning a lot. We are starting to really discover some neat things about bay otters with these videos with starting to analyze the scat scales and trying to figure out if we can do some group think with the diet analysis. Um, I have been teaching teachers how to use trail cameras to study biodiversity in urban environments, in rural environments, in a whole bunch of different places. We've been putting trail cameras in the hands of teachers, trying to get them out there and interested in teaching their kids about the creatures that come out at night that they may not even know are in their ecosystems too, right? And so, if you do want to start your own journey with trail cameras and learning about um, otters, you know, let me know. And we are offering virtual programs where I will send scat scales cleaned and cooked, um, otter clave, uh, to schools and groups and do a dissection with you live. Um, and then also I have a longer trail camera video analysis class and uh, programs that we're offering. So if that interests you, definitely feel free to email me. I'm happy to chat with you. Um, and it looks like we've got a minute longer. I do want to share with you one of my other favorite videos. Um, Tom Surfass, one of his students is studying skunks. And I just can't not show you this. These are baby skunks. And the way they got them onto camera, because this is a weasel study, the way they got them onto camera is they put a cat toy on um, a little stick. And so watch these little babies. Oh. They stand up on their hind legs when they're scared of something. But, but they want to play at the same time, which I think is hilarious. They have the biggest fierces ever. I don't know what you are, but I'm very fascinated. <laughs> anyway, um, so with that, I will stop sharing. And um, let's see if we can see if there are questions. If um, you want to put questions in the chat or you know, unmute, that's fine. I see some people are talking about seeing, you know, raccoons and otters and things that beaver lodges. I think that's pretty common, actually, from what I've seen people have told me about. Um, any other questions? Let's see. Well, thank you very much. First of all, that was just awesome. I <laughs> loved all the videos. It was very, very cool. Good. Anybody have questions about otters or anything they've seen or overmarking um, or even cameras? And honestly, I, I, have, I yeah. have a question about the, um, they're sort of, uh, they're, they're not picking fights with other species um, because they are so aquatic. I mean, do you, is it possible that it's an adaptation to protect because a wound would be more problematic for a, an animal that spends so much time in the water or? 
You know, I don't know. I, it may be a cost benefit analysis because some of the fish I see, they're bringing up American shad um, onto the dock. And those shad, I kid you not, are a foot plus long. And they're only eating like maybe a quarter of it and leaving it on the dock. And it may be that just food is abundant enough that it's not worth fighting over. Um, so it, it may be that cost benefit or it, it may be that's just like ospreys. They're not into fighting. I don't know. <laughs> Has has anything in, in your work so far uh, sort of supported the idea that they have a, a plentiful and varied diet more so than? Yes. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't I don't know all the things because unfortunately, you know, things like catfish and, you know, some of those creatures don't have scales. So if they don't, we're not finding evidence of them. But I've seen insect parts. I've seen some mammal bones. I've seen crayfish, a lot of blue crab. Blue crab is super common. Um, and then the fish species, a lot of slower moving nearshore fish. They like sunfish a lot. They like minnows a lot. Um, but really, we're just now starting to analyze that to figure out what we're seeing. Um, but those are some of the things. And the ducks, I know for sure the ruddy ducks um, and the snakeheads. But I, I'm, I know there are things we're missing we haven't seen yet, like eels we've seen and snakes. I know they're probably eating those too. Wow. Melissa asks, was the live duck a bufflehead? Yeah, it might have been a buffle head. Yeah, it might have been a buffle head. It's her ruddy, maybe a buffle. Anybody have a guess? What were your thoughts on that one? I know that I did have a ruddy. The first one, the very first video I showed, the tail was that little sharp pointy tail from the ruddy duck, but it might have been a buffle on the second one. Molly asks, how widespread are otters across the Chesapeake watershed? That's the big question. That's the thousand dollar question. We don't know. Um, I think they're more common than people think. And we're starting to get sightings from across the area. We've seen them at, you know, inland locations, the Anacostia. We've seen them in downtown DC. We've seen them all over. And I don't think we have a good quantification yet. And I don't think we have a good quantification on their home range. Um, talking to people that own docks and the marinas, they tell me they see otters relative to tides, but also wind. When the wind is blowing a certain way and the fish move into the marina, they can predict when the otters will show up. And so there's a lot we have yet to learn about where they're moving and why they're moving and how big that range is. So I, big question, stay tuned. <laughs> Let's see. Um, um, go ahead. Mm -hmm. You think you might eventually open up the fish scale volunteering to individuals as opposed to a group? We might. Um, if I can get a good enough key, I'm still trying to collect enough samples of different fish right now. And part of the challenge with those scat scales is they're really tiny and you really need good lenses or microscopes to see them. Um, you can get them with hand lenses and things, but it's really, it's not super easy. And the other part is the scales are usually that we take as our samples are taken from the lateral line, like right in the middle of the fish. But the scales up near, near the tail and the scales near the head, even though they're the same fish and the same species, look different. So it's a really nuanced type of sorting. And I'm still trying to figure out the protocols that would make it easy enough for everyone to be able to do it. And that's part of the experiment with sending these to schools and seeing what we can do. Uh, Eddie asks, do you want sightings on the Eastern shore as far away as the Asa Woman Canal? Yes, and we have our, um, our website is live and I did not put it into the PowerPoint, but if you email me, I can send you a link. But if you go to our CERC webpage for citizen science, it says get involved. Um, you can go to the otters and find the, the um, spotter uh, form and put information in. We'll take information from wherever right now because we're just trying to figure out what is this scope like somebody was asking. We don't have a good idea on it yet. Ian says he loves muskrat. Do mm -hmm. otters seem to get along with them? 
I have not seen that yet. Now I have seen muskrat in the same area as the otters, right? That overlook that you saw, I see muskrats there all the time. I've never seen them interact. I don't think they're really competing for the same foods because the muskrats are more of the herbivorous and you know, our otters are doing a lot of the other stuff. But I think it's sort of like beavers. They're probably in the same place. They're probably overmarking and using the same habitat, but they're doing this habitat partitioning by day, by time of day and um, resources. So yeah, well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for inviting me in. And you know, please feel free to reach out uh, if you have questions and I hope you'll join us for some other programs. Thank you so very much, Karen. That was delightful. I learned so much from you. And um, I hope, is there an email? Can I put your email in the chat? Sure, for I can put it in there. It is my Thank last name, McDonald, with a K, at si.edu. So super easy. Yeah. So if folks have questions or want to get involved or maybe have you make a presentation for their school, then um, I know Deanna Wheeler said she was interested in that. Oh, great. Someone's put in the CERC. Oh, good. Um, Thanks, Steve. I appreciate link that. Too. So that's awesome. Thank mm -hmm. you again, everyone, Thanks, for everyone. attending. This has been like, I think, our best attended one this year, <laughs> 85 participants. Nice. So thank you. thank you all to the Ma Na Master Naturalist who came tonight. Um, this has been awesome. So Thanks, I will go I'm going to stop the recording. Thanks again. Have a good night.